<laughs> so we have, a, we have maybe a little bit better title, something more encouraging than <laughs> unhealthy family relationships. Yeah. We, we'd like to, to change the title to Happy Holidays with Your Family. Okay. How to have happy father and holidays with your family. Does that sound yeah, that's a little probably bit much more better. <laughs> lifting. Yeah. Okay. So just by way of introduction, Sylvia and I have been married for 22 years plus. We we have this is actually the second marriage for both of us. I've got two adult sons from my first marriage of as a result of this being the second marriage for both of us, we've learned a lot of things along the way. Um, some experiences that, that I think have been beneficial for our, our marriage now. And hopefully you guys can learn from some of our mistakes without having to experience some of the, the elements that we've experienced in, in past relationships. Uh, we. I think that it, hey guys, but I think that, I think that what it does is gives us a perspective of gratitude for each other and the relationship that we have. Uh, the foundation for our relationship is God, which was not the way that it occurred in my first marriage. So that for sure has made all the difference in the world. And if you have God at the center of your marriage relationship, then it's going to make a big difference. So there's a, a little bit of a dynamic difference. So Mike is from a small family. So it's just him. He's got a brother a year and a half younger than him. And then was his parents. And so um, his mom is also an only child. And then you've got me. My mother was the oldest of 10 children. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then I have, uh, I'm one of five. So um, when you think about like putting families together, he kind of went into shock a little bit um, coming into my family, and I probably felt the same about going into his family. We're used to a lot of people, used to being pretty loud, and just always people being around, and they are not. <laughs> so that was an interesting dynamic. So. Another thing for me to get used to is everybody in her family has a nickname. Yeah. She has an uncle. His nickname is Uncle Brother. Now, so, how the two of those go together, I'm not quite sure, but that's just an example. <laughs> so, with a marriage relationship, there have got to be there's got to be something that keeps you focused, keeps you grounded. You know, we're coming up on the holidays. Family dynamics can can have a significant impact on your marriage. On your marriage relationship. So there are two what we consider to be go-to scriptures that help to keep us grounded and I'll share those with you. The first is from Mark 10 7 through 8. It says, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh. And that one is really very significant because when you were single, if you can remember back when that was, you pretty much did your own thing. You kept your own schedule, you were focused on meeting your needs and not necessarily so focused on meeting the needs of another significant person. Well, when you become married and you are one flesh, then your focus has to change if you're going to have a successful marriage relationship. And I think the significance of this is that a lot of times this is the scripture that's used when, when you get married. And honestly, this is the scripture that we use in our relationship on a daily basis. It's like, okay, am I functioning like one flesh, you know, or am I doing my own thing? You know, I remember when we were counseling this uh, a younger couple in they wanted to get involved in, in a project together. And she didn't really understand it, but he did. And, you know, it was going to take a significant amount of money. And so he said, you know, well, I'm just, okay, I'm just going to do it. And we're like, okay, hold it. <laughs> and we, you know, Mike opened the scripture and he, he asked him, you know, are you 
really functioning in that one flesh relationship by not making sure that your wife and you are on the same page. And it's the same way. When we think about um, the holidays, I mean, there has been, we've been married for 22 years and there's been no holiday that we have spent without both of his parents. Now his parents have been divorced. Well, his dad just died. I don't know if you guys know that, but his parents had been married, um, but like 35 years ago but they were still friends. So they would both come to our house at the same time. They would both like pack bags to stay for a while. And we had to really make sure that we were aligned because my family would come, but most often they weren't staying. We used to travel here because we're from up, up north and we would travel on Christmas every year for years so that we could make sure that we had time with his side of the family, and then I could go, we could come here to be with my side of the family. So the, the second go-to scripture for us is from Matthew 16, 24, which reads, then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And why that's so significant is because a marriage relationship is about sacrificing, about focusing on more than just yourself, about doing things and, and sort of integrating elements that maybe sometimes you're not totally comfortable with, but because your wife or your husband feels those things are important, you embrace those things, you take them on. Maybe you just don't want to do it. Get being uncomfortable. Maybe you're just like, I just don't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, where the scripture comes in. So we're talking about a marriage relationship during the holidays where you've got a lot of people around. You've, you're inviting people into your home in some cases. And it's not just the holidays that this applies to, but because we're entering the holiday season, of course, some of these things apply right now but I think about about Sylvia and me in terms of the way that we sort of view the roles that we have with with our friends and family when they when they come to come to visit or when it comes to responsibilities related to them for example my dad two years ago he fell in his apartment <coughs> At the time, he was 88 years old, he fell in his apartment. We had no idea that he had fallen. We had been trying to reach him for a couple of days. Uh, as it turned out, a, a brother that studied the Bible with him at the age of 87 went to check on him, and he discovered that he was, was down in his apartment. He had apparently had fallen, couldn't get up for a couple of days, and and you know they called 911. He was transported to the hospital. Uh, he was in ICU for a couple of days. He he recovered. He went to a rehabilitation facility. But it became very evident to to us and to him that he needed to be closer to to us. He was in Virginia at the time, so we moved him here. And from the time that we moved him it became just a, a never, never ending series of health challenges and issues. You know, amputations and, and surgeries and multiple hospitalizations and doctor's visits like you wouldn't believe every single week. Medication management. Medication management and, and not only that, but also it was a case where he wasn't able financially to provide completely for his well-being. So we we kicked in the difference. But the significant difference. But what's what's important about this story is is Sylvia didn't view him as my dad and hence my responsibilities. She viewed him as our dad and we shared responsibilities. So she took him to doctor's visits just like I did. She managed his medic medications. She took care of 
all the things that you take care of for an elderly parent who who doesn't have the full capability to take care of themselves. And you know, I think about that as an example of the way that that you've got to figure out how to operate when it comes to friends and family that visit. It's not one person's responsibility, it's your joint responsibility. And I think that, um, you know, I, I looked at, people would always say, oh my gosh, so they, you know, I would literally sit there at the end, I was feeding him, and he was giving other people a difficult time, and I was like, just until you get your strength back, and you know, I'm feeding him and stuff, and people were saying, you know, this is, Sylvia, this, that's so good. I'm like, how can I say I love my husband and not take responsibility to help take care of his dad? You know, I mean, both of my parents are deceased at, and they have been for, for a while, but um, for, for us, the foundation was so important because once you like hit something really hard in your life like this, it's like if you, if you aren't strong in, in your marriage, it could literally like take you down. And we would look at each other like exhausted, 11 o'clock at night, and there's no, there was no date night, there was no, like all that stuff goes out of the window when somebody's needs are greater than your own. And we would just look at each other, we, we prayed a lot, you know, we, we read scriptures together a lot. We've actually have marriage devotionals, we've had them for 22 years now. Every weekend, you know, we figured I'm giving, you know, I'm making sure I have my own times with God. He is, but we, and we're studying the Bible with people. We need to make sure that we're in the scriptures together about a relationship. And so we've done that. Um, and we have some resources that we can share with you if you're interested. But um, it was it, in the same way, as I mentioned, I came from a, a large family and I have a sister who's a disciple here at North River and who's a year older than me. She's literally my best friend. Uh, besides Mike, mm -hmm. and she has some health issues, and so he's always thinking of her a lot of times before I do. And um, I remember this year we finally decided not to cut our own grass because we were like, we just don't have time. But my sister got laid off, and he's going over there every other week. Mike said, I'm gonna go cut her grass today and trimming her hedges, and it's because it's not just my sister or you know whether it's somebody who's gotten himself in trouble one of my nephews and mike's got to go you know to the bank and get him honest to goodness out of jail like whatever <laughs> like he's done it well we're at home and he'll go down there and take care of, like whatever so we're not it, it's it's definitely we're partners even when it comes to hosting it's interesting how women and men have different priorities when it comes to these things <laughs> and what's so helpful is mike says so what's your priority for me? Like, what's your priority for this? And that's so helpful, because it's not like him saying, well, I'm gonna go clean out the gutters right now, and I don't care about the gutters. Like, we gotta get this table set and food ready, et cetera, and he says, what's your priority? And so that's where, it, it's, there's no, like, this is what he does, and this is what I do. You know, if he's, he's been sick, I'll go take the garbage cans down. It really doesn't matter, and that, so it's a true, partnership and really con thinking about the interests of each other above ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something really important. And it's not necessarily easy. You know, I know for me, when we have it's family, <laughs> it's, sometimes it's not. Not, not, so much, not so much in my relationship with, with Sylvia, it's really when you introduce more people into the mix and you've got friends and family and commitments and all these things going on, especially this time of the year, I personally just don't have the wherewithal within myself to be able to do all the things that, that I'm called to do. So how do I do it? It's, <laughs> it's one simple word, and that word is prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, asking God to show me and us the way to get it done, to be loving, to be giving, to share, to to welcome people into our home because, you know, if it were left up to me sometimes, you know, I would just go and, and lock myself in my room and, and everybody just go and, and leave me alone. But I can't do that. You know, as, as a disciple, we are called to, to reach out, to share, to love, to give, to serve. And 
even if that's not your nature, we're still called to do those things. Mm -hmm. So how do you overcome your own personal selfish nature to do things that, that, that you're responsible for doing as a disciple? It's, you know, by asking God to leverage his resources and, and to use you in a way that enables you to do these things. So we literally start preparing ourselves spiritually before we know that people are coming. And that literally means focusing on specific things that are going to help us get through situations. And, um, not, and, and then we do pray every day. But then there are times where like somebody's just said something that's put you over the edge. That might not happen to you guys. That <laughs> happens to us occasionally. And I'll, I'll look at him, he'll look at me, and I'll say, <laughs> you know, not to that, you know, we'll like disappear and I'll say, you know, I really feel like X, Y, Z. Now, got to pick your battles because a lot, it could be anybody's family. I've got difficult people and a large group of difficult people sometimes <laughs> on my side. And sometimes it's just the element of either his mom or in many cases his mom and his dad and their interactions. But it's like, he'll say, okay, you, you do X, Y, Z. I got this and, and that's, you know, it's not waiting until the weekend's over or the evening's over and then you know your heart's in a bad place because what we do want to make sure that we do is enjoy the people that we have in our home too. I mean, a lot of times in the past we have done things like just enduring it or just like, like holding on for dear life and just you can't wait until the evening's over. Well, I don't think that's pleasing to God either. And it's appreciating the relationships that we have, our family, and really finding a way to enjoy being together. And so, yeah, we prepare ourselves spiritually probably a week or two in advance and throughout. And sometimes it's easier said than done. And who can relate to this? You've got a family member who you love to death. But if that family member comes to live with you, or to stay in your space for a period of time, there's friction. There may be bad feelings. Maybe the two of you just don't quite mesh. That certainly has happened to me. And you know, I, I'm not gonna name any names with who that family member is, but it's someone who's near and dear to my heart. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, not me. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that does occur sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes you have to just figure out a way to grin and bear it and, and to, to, to overlook yeah. behaviors or actions that may cause you to struggle, recognizing that this person or these people are probably only there for a defined period of time. Maybe you can say something or do something that will encourage that person or those people. Mm -hmm. I think um, sometimes one of the biggest things that we can be up against is that my personality is just a little bit different than Mike's. So he's more of an introvert. I for sure am not. <laughs> And so um, we know what each other's strengths and weaknesses are, and there'll be times that we should be just relaxing and hosting people where after maybe an hour and a half, Mike's kind of feeling like I'm done here. And then I'll, I'm looking for him and he's in his office. <laughs> and I'm like, Mike, you, you can't stay in here like this. I'm like, where we have people and he's like, Sarah, so I've been out there for like an hour and a half. Now this is our family, <laughs> this is our family. And, and I'm like, I get it, but they're here to be with us. And so, you know, it's, it's understanding each other, but then sometimes really helping the other person to look beyond themselves when, you know, people are there because they wanna to be together and wanna to be with you. And so, you know, he's got a cutoff. So when I said, we ha our family's coming over at like 6.30, he says, till when? I said, until they leave. <laughs> he wants like an end time. And so, um, I don't know, it's I think calling each other higher when we need to, to do that as well. Um, and so if we see something in each other, not to pick on each other, but to be gentle and humble in the way that we're trying to help each other, but seeing that, hey, maybe the way that 
you're dealing with this person or the group isn't the best way. Yeah. And I think also just remembering that holiday preparations mean more than just decorating the tree and mm -hmm. putting lights out and, and all those things. It really means being prepared spiritually for what you're going to be faced with. And, I, you know, I don't, I don't want it to sound like doom and gloom because, you know, friends and family are coming. But the fact of the matter is people and relationships and those situations sometimes can create an atmosphere that not only causes you to struggle, but also can create tension between you and your spouse. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that you want is tension between you and your spouse certainly not at the holidays but not at any time mm -hmm. i think that's the two primary things i mean we could talk all night about <laughs> our experiences and examples of people that have come over i think one big thing is the way that we entertain i'm like over the top all right i'll just be honest i mean if there was a red carpet i would roll it out and have people come in and you know, I just want to think about if there's somebody, I know they don't eat this and I'm going to do this, one thing for them, this thing for them, this, and he says, so can we just, can we just like order pizza sometime? And I was like, no, no, <laughs> like, no. For her, it has to be a, like a world-class gourmet experience. <laughs> I'd be happy with $5 Little Caesars pizza. Right, right, we would. But I, my, my perspective is that I want to love people by the way that we open up our home and host them. And so I want to make sure that when they walk through the door, it's an experience. It's not just a meal. Now, I'm not like making French food or anything <laughs> like that, but I want to have it safe, table set nicely. I, I want to think about what's going to encourage whoever is coming through the door. And so we've agreed that it's just not gonna happen, the whole pizza thing, um, <laughs> because that for me too, and for us collectively, is a way for us to show people how much we love them through our hospitality. And I think that it can be the same way, even with difficult people that you open your home to. Do one little special thing that you know would encourage them, and it's amazing how their perspectives change and how your perspective changes and how it could change the whole dynamic and flow of the evening or you know the several evenings. Just think about what's gonna encourage this person. I can give you an example. When we have Tom and Kelly Brown over, I make collard greens. You know why? Mm -hmm. Because Tom loves them. I mean, he just does. I don't know why or how, you know, it somehow doesn't match up culturally with what I think, but it, he does. I mean, and so I try to do that. Mike makes chocolate chip cookies with pecans from scratch. People call, did Mike make his cookies? You know, because they know that that's what he does in order to, to show them how much he loves them and wants them to have a great experience with us. So, so let, us, let us stop talking for a second or two. Throw it open to you guys. What would you like to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I appreciate y'all sharing about um, being prepared spiritually um, before, before family comes in. Um, but one specific thing I wanted to ask is, um, have y'all ever dealt? Um, Are you comfortable just pulling your mask down a little bit? Yeah. Just so it just makes it a little easier to hear. I'm yeah. sorry. Um, have Have y'all had an experience where a, a family member has come in into your home and and uh, with our heightened political situation going on right now, having to deal with uh, a certain family member that maybe is, is expressing uh, political views that you might not agree with, uh, or it might uh, turn into an argument with somebody else in the family. I was wondering if y'all have ever experienced that. We, we haven't, and we probably wouldn't, because we would make it clear that we're not doing that. We're not talking about that, because this is the time for us to come together as family. And so I would, we would shut it down. Mm -hmm. I mean, anything that's going to create dissension, it's the host's responsibility to manage that so it doesn't, not only doesn't impact you, but doesn't impact the rest of your guests. Mm -hmm. But recognizing that some families have kind of a natural adversarial type dynamic mm -hmm. within them, you know, you might have members of one party on this side and members of another party on the other side and 
when the two come together, there's just this natural friction. I think that can exist. <laughs> I think that probably as the host, you would have some, some duty or responsibility to manage it in a way that, that people feel heard and respected without there being a contentious, you know, you don't want, <laughs> you don't want to fight in the middle of, of Thanksgiving dinner. But you're saying it's okay at the same time to have healthy conversations as long as they are within certain boundaries. Yeah, I mean, there, there are gonna be situations yeah. where people agree to disagree, and I think that's okay. From my standpoint, those are the healthy conversations to have. When you have situations where someone absolutely believes that unless you're thinking the way that I think, then you're, you're un, an un, unintelligent person, and that's where, where it becomes difficult. But if people can agree to disagree and have conversation and, and allow the other to express themselves, then I don't see a problem with that. That's, that's not what it sounded like to me, but I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's situation. Share, share more about that. Oh, uh, well, it's, it's actually, <laughs> well, um, not in my family, but uh -huh. thinking about my wife's family. Um, we are of mixed races, mm -hmm. and things have come out from my side of the family. And this, this, whole, this mm -hmm. whole political climate in the past four years, five years has been <laughs> very, I don't know what the word is, but it's just bad. Difficult. Yeah. 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 A, lot, a lot of a lot of things people are expressing things more often and um what is it? it's just one it's just some things that have come out of a certain person's mouth have been very offensive to people that look a certain way. That is the majority of our family versus the minority of our family, mm -hmm. I guess you could say. So it's made a lot of people uncomfortable all at one time. Like, part of the family, but you're saying things that are offensive to the majority of us in the room, mm -hmm. kind of thing. So. See, and I, I really have mixed feelings. You know, on the one hand, it feels right to me to engage in healthy debate and conversation. But on the other hand, a lot of what we've observed over the past year or so is that those, those debates become unhealthy because neither side is really willing to accept that there is a different point of view. And I have a different perspective, or maybe not completely different. I just feel like if somebody's offended by, by somebody else's perspective, then it's best not to have that conversation. Because what's the point, really? Yeah. You know, If it's going to create dissension, mm -hmm. it's best not to, and, it's, and political conversations are at the top of the list, next to religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't know, so I guess context question for you guys too, like if, were you not the host of the situation? No. Like, no. I was going to ask like in situations where you're still, and this leads to another question of like, when is a really good time to start hosting your own times with family versus just going to yeah. uh, local parents or local older family that is around your area, but like if you're not in control of the hosted environment, is it most important at that point just to be like, good as a team or maybe contributing to shutting the conversation down if people are getting too worked up, I guess, how that would be navigated. Well, that's, that's a difficult situation, especially when you're not in your own home. But there was but, family. But to the extent that you can at least attempt to be a peacemaker, <laughs> someone who reconciles the differences between the two sides, then I think that's a, an important role to play. But Admittedly, that's a, a difficult situation. And I, I think in answer to your other question, um, if, when you have the space, if you have the space, I think that you and your wife talk about it and then you know make sure the family has advance notice, like several months advance notice that we would like to host this year. And so for instance, every year almost we host, but we, and so we make the turkey for Thanksgiving, but then we have family members that bring something else. 
so that it's not like you guys in the, at home hosting and making like 20 dishes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I think that a lot of times people are waiting for that, for the, you know, the young married couple to, to be the one to, to host. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. As long as you have the space. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that, like, I guess earlier in your marriage, you guys would split, like, Christmas, like, travel on Christmas Day or whatever. Uh, I was just curious, what did that conversation look like? Like, was that an easy decision, or was it natural, or um, was that something that you guys both had to kind of, like, debate your sides or anything? No, because we had, um, at the time, um, my stepsons now who are adults, they were like 12 and 16. Mm -hmm. And so it was really important that they spend time with us mm -hmm. together as a family. And then, you know, they would go home and spend the rest of the time with um, their mom's side, side of the family. Mm -hmm. And so, no, I think that I knew how important it was that we be there with them. And he knew how important it was for me to be with my family. So for years, that's mm -hmm. just what we did. It wasn't a hard conversation. Yeah, for years we traveled on Christmas Day. Yeah. <laughs> so we'd have Christmas, you know, festivities in the morning, and then by the afternoon we were on a, a flight to here. Yes. Yeah. When we lived in the north. So it wasn't hard for us. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think that it is definitely something when you're trying to consider, when you're thinking about children when you're thinking even without children thinking about size of the family i know that at, at a certain point in time it's going to be we're with, we're with these guys for thanksgiving and these this part of the family for christmas and then maybe switch the next year we're with this part of the family for you know vice versa um and so now that we're down here it, it's easy you know we pretty much host everything because <laughs> our home is bigger and everybody it's like our family home mm -hmm. now so I have something. Yes. So, um, and just to share a little more about us. So, I always think of it as like, like Chrissy's family is more of like the holiday movie, like traditional <laughs> movie where like everyone's together and there's like all these different traditions and stuff like that. And my family's probably more of like the parody of a, of a, of a holiday movie when there's like dysfunction, nobody's together. If they are, there's a fight or like, <laughs> like my dad doesn't even believe in the holiday. It's just like, it's just chaos so we have 10 we, we we do the holidays with her family pretty much and um but what i've learned like no matter if it's the holidays or whatever how do you guys work to be on the same page and you kind of said it earlier with like you know god first and everything but how do you guys have that conversation and be on the same page of when there is something that one of you wants to do that the other person wants to do you know coming together as one and maybe giving up what you want to do or giving up what you want to do because you know it's important for the other spouse. Mm -hmm. Well, Seth, I think you really hit on something that is, is the key to a marriage relationship. One aspect of it is accepting that there are differences between you and your spouse. You know, Sylvia and I are, are completely different, but we complement one another. Mm -hmm. And it's not just accepting those differences, but figuring out a way to embrace those differences and love those differences because ultimately you've got to love the entire person, not just bits and pieces of, of the person. But figuring out a way also to, to have constructive conversations, recognizing the strengths and weaknesses of each, you know, she has tremendous strengths in areas where I'm tremendously weak and, and vice versa in some cases. <laughs> but we, we view it as a collaboration, a partnership. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not meant to be a dictatorship. Yes, the man is, is the head of the household, but as head of the household, you have a duty, a responsibility to make sure that you, you engage your spouse to be part of the conversation, not, not to be the dictator of that, of that relationship, but to work as a, as a collaboration so that input from both sides is, is integrated into whatever it is that you're doing. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, I mean, we're very strong communicators, and um, sometimes I don't even think it's hard to have conversations. I think that we've always been 100% open about how we're feeling, and, um, you know, I remember one time early on, like, Mike and I would be doing all this stuff, like, um, church-related activities, and we were in the same space, but we were around all these other people. And so we, we came home, this was when we were, we were married probably like two years at this point. We came home and I was like, you know, I really miss you. And he said, what do you mean? We've been together like all day. <laughs> and so I said, well, you know, I said, I was really just sharing my heart with you. I said, but the way you responded makes me not want to share how I feel. And it's like, even being saying that, like to me, I, I'm, it just sounded kind of weak. But I was like, I gotta let him know how I'm feeling so that he understands. And so we, when we have our times together, like our marriage devotionals, I remember like one of them was on submission. <laughs> and I was like, I really feel like, uh, you know, I'm doing good in this area. And he says to me, still, you know what? He goes, you're a leader. You're like a natural born leader. And I was like, oh, thanks. He goes, the problem is though, that sometimes you run ahead of me. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you're right. Like, but it was not like him saying, like slamming me hard about it. It's like, you're a leader, but sometimes you can run ahead of me. And I don't want to run ahead of him. I want us to be like on the same page. So it's really being able to get that vulnerable, to get that humble, and to be able to talk through things until you are, you know, 100% aligned. And it doesn't mean that you're both 100% satisfied with the answer, but you're 100% aligned with whatever the answer is. And it definitely is compromise and give and take. It's not like whatever he says or whatever I say, it's what we collectively figure out together is going to be best. And I want him to be happy. He wants me to be happy. And we're like, okay, if there's a way that we can both be happy, then that's great. But if not, you know, it's, it's, it's fine. Like the next time, you know, maybe the compromise will be a little bit different. So that we're like, okay, remember we did the, okay, yeah, 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 let's do this. You know, what you want to do this time. And sometimes, many times. Like watching Penn State football. <laughs> <laughs> many times, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. If you can communicate even difficult things in a loving manner, your spouse is going to accept those things so much more easily and willingly. Mm-hmm. It's hard to do, mm-hmm. especially when you're in the heat of the, the issue, whatever it may be. But you've got to figure out how to take a step back and communicate in a loving way so that your spouse can hear you and what your issues are as opposed to becoming defensive. I have another one. <laughs> okay, so this one's maybe a little deeper. So you guys called out that you've had people like live with you and then also like, you know, helping somebody get out of a sticky situation and um, things like that. That is very common in my family. And we, I have brought my spouse into those situations before and probably haven't led her in there the best ways. <laughs> um, but that has caused like some, you know, I guess tension or whatever and then with me I've also dealt with like you know codependency not having any boundaries like that kind of thing Um, I'm curious to know how those kinds of conversations when you guys have dealt with those situations um, what those conversations look like and then how I don't know how have you come up with a you know a result on how you're gonna deal with the situation and be on the same page together with those situations Let, let me say this first of all it is so much easier to have difficult conversations than it is to not have those conversations and go your own way and just do and, and decide you're gonna do what you wanna do regardless of what your, your spouse thinks. I th- can think of at least two situations where the husband made decisions based on what he thought was best, what he thought was right, keeping his wife completely out of the loop on significant financial issues. You know, where the, you know where the two of those are today? Uh, Divorced. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. It's that critical. I know one, they were disciples. Were, yep. they, were they both disciples? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's serious. So as difficult as it may be, you've got to approach these things in a team fashion, have those hard conversations so that the ramifications of not having conversations but making decisions on your own don't have to come to roost. And I think in a practical sense, um, we would have conversations about, in, about whoever was gonna be staying with us. Now his dad didn't live with us, but we've had a niece that's lived with us, we've had a nephew that's lived with us, and a niece a few times that's lived with us. And we talked about it ahead of time, you know, okay, um, should we do this? And we agree, we both agreed, yes, we should. How long should we do this for? Like, what's that gonna look like? And then when we were at the end of our rope, okay, she's gotta go. Mm -hmm. And we were both like, she's gotta go. Yeah. Because we were both, you know, looked at the behaviors and it wasn't working. And then we're at a place where we're like, nobody can live with us. Mm -hmm because our lifestyle is such that we're going, giving, going, serving, like we can't, our home is our haven. It's gotta be the safe place that we can be in order to have a healthy relationship. Um, and so we'll have somebody, somebody can come stay for a week, but then they gotta go home. Mm -hmm. Like we're not gonna just have an open-ended thing. Now that's just what we've decided. You know, you might decide something differently, but to believe that moving someone into your home is not gonna change the dynamic of your relationship is just not realistic. We have good friends right now that have, we, we said, guys, we don't know that that's a good idea for you to you know go there, go wherever you're going and move in with somebody's mom. And sure enough, it, the relationship is, is not good and it wasn't a good decision. And you can have a great relationship outside of your, your space, but when people move in and live with you, yeah. it changes the dynamic. Yeah, and, I'm not, and I'm not suggesting that you never do it because certainly there may be yeah. situations where for whatever reason, family considerations, that it's something that you feel compelled to do, mm -hmm. but you have got to make sure that you two are on the same page if and when you make those decisions because and, oh, it's sorry. it's uh, it does change the dynamic as mm -hmm. Sylvia said and have boundaries about what that's going to look like mm -hmm. specifics about what it's going to look like mm -hmm. like we were like okay he can be here he needs a job mm -hmm. we we don't need his money but he needs to put some of that money away and like just trying to help people be responsible so that when it's time, they can move on. Mm -hmm. Major financial decisions, do them together, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, good, good stuff. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Brandon? Yeah, and also to add on, thank you guys for the thoughts you've been given. Yeah. Um, this is to add on to Seth's question, like for example, if there's family, I think I can struggle with that a little too, of like, codependency in the sense of like, I really want to help with everything that's going wrong with my family members, but in situations where they're compelling you to help them, um, specifically even just with people that are older, like even my parents have, they have struggles, but it's like trying to help, but also express boundaries. Is there any situations where you guys have had to express boundaries to your parents or seniors that like, you want to be respectful, but you want to be like, with boundaries at the same time. It's going to like affect our lives negatively. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I go ahead. I was going to say your first commitment is to each other. Right. You know, and as as especially as a husband, you know, when it comes to your your mom or your dad or whoever, it's like okay, my I, my wife, I need to consider my wife first. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, I think the hard thing with parents. Is is them looking at you like not like you're they're your, you're their kid, yeah. like you're an, an adult. Mm -hmm. You have a wife, maybe at some point a family, and so it can be t hard for parents to step back and view you that way, 
And so I think it's important that you help them view you that way by making sure they understand that, no, that's not gonna be good for me and my wife. That's powerful. You don't even have to, you, you know, you don't even have to like really cut them off or anything, or maybe you do, I don't know. Like, cause I'm somebody who wants to take care of my family and I could be like, you know, could you, can we help pay for this? Can we help pay for that? And after a while, my husband's like, so we've done this, we've done this, we've done this. I think it's enough. I'm like, you're right. But, but too, there, you know, you, it's not as though this person is just somebody from off the street. You've got an emotional attachment, an emotional connection. So as a result of that, it, it sometimes makes it difficult. It makes, it pushes you in a direction toward making decisions that on the outside looking in just don't make any sense financially. So my, you know, my encouragement is that you try to figure out what makes sense and do it in a way that, that helps but doesn't enable mm -hmm. behaviors that really shouldn't be repeated. You know, if you're doing a one-time thing or you know, even if it's a continuing source of, of support, you have to figure out a way to do it so that this person recognizes one, you're giving out of the kindness of your heart, not because of some obligation or duty, but this is what you've chosen to do, but also that, that your resources have some limit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> They're finite. Mm -hmm. right. That's a good point. Mm -hmm.